welcome to another episode of the Good Heart Story podcast. Today is going to be a very special conversation with the amazing Jerry Sitzer, who you may know of, you may not, but let me tell you, you are in for quite a treat um, in talking about all the things we like talking about here on the Good Heart Story podcast. And Jerry is a professor emeritus of theology and senior fellow at Whitworth University, which total side note, my nanny in California went to Whitworth and I'm a huge fan. And he specializes in the history of Christianity, Christian spirituality and religion in American public life. Wow. He has written nine books, including A Grace Disguised, which 25 years later, the new edition of Grace Disguised was endorsed by yours truly. So I'm um, even more of a fan of that special book. And he is currently married to Patricia since 2010. He has married children two married stepchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. And Jerry, before I share any more of your story, um, I thought it would be more appropriate if you wanted to share um, a bit more of your story and journey into deep loss. Well, I'll give you the short version, Catherine. I don't fixate as much on that as I fixate on the response, the ongoing story after that particular explosion in our lives. So I'll give you the short version. I was married to Linda. We had been living in Spokane for two years. She was a homeschooler. We had four children at the time. Uh, Catherine was eight. David had just turned seven. Uh, Diana Jane was four and John was two. And we went on a homeschooling expedition on a Friday night to a Native American tribe. We participated in their powwow. And uh, and so on. It was part of the unit she was teaching for homeschooling. And uh, after leaving uh, the powwow, uh, we uh, drove about 10 minutes and uh, a car uh, driving way over the speed limit uh, struck our uh, van uh, head on. The driver was uh, uh, intoxicated, had a very high blood uh, alcohol content. Mm -hmm. And my mother was visiting us for the weekend too. And so she was also in the van. And when the dust settled, uh, I lost three members of my family. My mother died. She was 75 at the time. And uh, my four-year-old daughter, Dinah Jane, and my wife, Linda, uh, two people died in the other accident as well. So five lost their lives in that tragedy. It was a, a, just a horrific experience, you can well imagine. My two-year-old was seriously injured, but has since uh, entirely recovered. And I had to figure out what it would mean for me over the long haul to live out a story uh, that had this kind of explosion in it and oh. such a significant loss of life, three generations of females in in one moment of time. So that's yes. the, the short version. I think the more important mm. thing is not so much the accident itself. We all have uh, the poison we have to, uh, to, to drink, but right. it's it's the outcome, what, what it means to live out a life. Mm. Uh, for God in the wake of such a terrible tragedy. I want to say to Catherine that this is a kind of big event, really noticeable. It was covered in the papers for some time, it made national news. There are lots of little losses that are just as catastrophic in their own way uh, that don't receive notice, that don't necessarily receive a claim. In fact, uh, an interesting side story, several years later, a, a man came up to me and said, I've been resentful of you for three years. And I looked at him, I didn't even know him that well. And I said, why? And he said, uh, when your accident occurred, um, you became an instant hero. Uh, when my loss occurred, uh, the opposite happened to me. And uh, it just reminded me that not all losses receive immediate acclamation, not all losses receive immediate sympathy some because there's shame involved and some because they're quiet, they're silent. People don't see the outcome. So I'm mindful uh, of all the listeners here that their stories may be different from mine and may not be as public as mine, but are just as serious and just as catastrophic as mine was. Oh gosh, I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, I have dealt 
and, and moves through it, but with tremendous guilt all along from initial survivor's guilt to the guilt of being acclaimed and set up as this hero all along. And um, it's been very painful to, um, to, to, to want to come down and to not be put up on this pedestal and to say, oh, goodness, all of my brothers and sisters who have things like a stroke and become disabled are worthy of um, celebration of being here just as I am, and I'm no different. So I, um, I think that means so much, and what a beautiful thing to share right at the top of this interview, Jerry. That's, um, that's quite something. Thank you. You know, I hadn't encountered your work until after my stroke and recovery. I am honestly amazed that we have come to so many of the same conclusions about suffering and ultimately God's sovereignty. You say the experience of loss will never go away, but we can learn to carry it. It can become integrated into a larger and more healthier whole. Honestly, I often say that I am so much more whole than even before I was broken. So my question is, how do we begin the work of healing, of learning to carry our grief? And what could that larger, healthier, whole version of ourselves look like? But I think sooner or later, when we suffer any kind of loss, long-term, short-term, immediate, extended over a period of time, whatever it happens to be. And I define loss as something beyond, behind which you can't ever get again. In other words, there's no yeah. return to a normality that you experience before the loss. Mm, yeah. so it changes the landscape of your life. Of course. Um, it, it, a broken leg can be healed. An amputated leg can't. You can I have an artificial limb, but nothing is ever the same again. Yes. Same with the loss of a loved one or the loss of a marriage or the loss of health or, in your case, a stroke. Yes. So I, I want to say that. And the most important thing to do over a long period of time is to just stare it down, to look at it, to walk around it as if you're observing a work of art. Now, it's difficult to do because you feel such emotion in it, a mm -hmm. sense of loss, a sense of pain, a sense of shame a sense of guilt, a sense of anger or bewilderment. How did this happen? Mm. Why did this happen? I, I can't believe it happened. And that takes a long time to do, to be able to look at it and study it and be present to it, be attentive to it. And that will often unleash a lot of emotion, as I mentioned, uh, a, a wide variety of emotions that will come at you. I, I never struggled with anger that much. Some people do. I struggled with deep sadness and probably the most prominent emotion for me was bewilderment. I just kept looking at life and thinking it doesn't make sense anymore. It I feels disordered to me. Yes. I can't connect yes. the dots. I can't put it together into a rational whole. The, right. the feeling of disorder was profoundly threatening to me. See, mm -hmm. so that was one of my primary emotions. Eventually, as you look at it, often with the help of a small group, a friend, a mentor, a, a therapist, mm -hmm. you can begin to approach it and gradually see it as a part of a larger whole. I use this analogy. I uh, live on the east side of uh, the state of Washington. Our biggest mountain is Mount Rainier. It's on the west side of the state. It's 14,410 feet. I've uh, hiked um, uh, in it. I've stared at it. I've gotten close to it. When you're close to Mount Rainier, it's literally the only thing you see. Mm. I mean, it is so towering and so massive. It mm. consumes the entire range of what your eye can see. Mm. Over time, as you leave it and back up and you become not, um, you see it not from a half a mile away, but from five miles away and then 10 miles away and then 50 miles away, the size of the mountain never changes. It's always 14,410 feet. But your perspective changes because it's integrated 
into a larger landscape. Mm, well, I wow. think over time, if you do the work you need to do spiritually and emotionally and intellectually and so on, the, the experience gets integrated into a larger landscape of meaning. And it takes its own place. It fulfills its own function. It becomes part of, I'm borrowing your language here, Catherine, part of a larger story, a story of yeah, redemption yeah. that mm. continues to unfold. Now, there's no way of knowing that ahead of time. That just takes time and work and prayer and growth. The other analogy I'd use, and uh, this came to me as I was writing A Grace Disguised, it's as if you have this huge tree in your backyard, huge oak tree, beautiful tree. And it occupies a lot of your memory as you think about the picnics you had under it, and the swing swinging from it, and all the play and the climbing and the tree forts and everything. And it gets diseased and it has to be cut down. So every time you look into that backyard, you see an empty space that was occupied by this beautiful tree. And you feel that loss. You feel as, as if all the memory you had of your childhood has been stripped away from you because that tree is no longer there. Finally, you decide over time, you know what? I can't replace that tree, but I can plant around the stump that still is there. Flowers, bushes, maybe a pergola, whatever you do, so that the stump represents what you lost, but the planting of newness, of new life, uh, represents the kind of life you want to live now. And I think the juxtaposition of old and new, loss and replanting, mm. is really the pathway we need to follow out of, out of our loss. Mm. Uh, the mountain becomes smaller in our vision, even if it's not smaller in size, and we see it integrated into a larger landscape. I think that is just, oh, it gives me chills, honestly. That is such a beautiful picture of how I felt that the mountain hasn't gotten any smaller. It's still as awful as it was from the very beginning that I had this terrible stroke and became disabled. But it's perspective. It's gotten smaller and smaller as I've spent years um, in the opposite direction. I think that's really, really powerful. Thank you for sharing. I loved this insight from you. Our experience of loss does not have to be the defining moment of our lives. The transforming power of loss can be the defining moment instead. That's just beautifully said. I love the way you describe the effects of loss on our identities. That loss leaves our own selves homeless. We don't know where we fit into our lives now. We have the opportunity to form a new version of ourselves that integrates the loss rather than makes the loss our entire identity. Mm -hmm. In The Grace Disguised, you quote Nicholas Waltersdorf and write, the valley of suffering is the veil of soul making. Wow. Mm -hmm. I often say life defines us, suffering refines us, and ultimately hope redefines us. So my question for you is, how did you prevent your tragedy from becoming your identity? Well, it's always a temptation, isn't it? To, to allow mm -hmm. some kind of loss, again, whatever it happens to be, big or small, extended over a period of time or immediate um, to become the defining moment of our lives, we kind of fixate on it. it. It's a little like the person who has a dramatic conversion experience and the story they tell for the rest of their life is that conversion experience, instead of talking about the outcome, uh, what happened afterwards, how it formed or changed your marriage and your vocation and everything else. It's always a temptation for us to fixate on either the peak moments of our lives or the valleys of our lives, mm -hmm. the great moments or the terrible moments. Yes. And we kind of obsess over them until they dominate our lives. That's what our lives become is that those events that define us, uh, however great or terrible they happen to be. But what matters more is the long-term work, the long-term grace that we receive to have the outcome, the response become the defining moment of our lives. So it's not to use uh, 
a common example. It's not the birth of the baby. It's what you do with the child after they're born. Right. It's yeah. not the marriage it, or excuse me. It's not the wedding. It's the marriage. Right. You see the difference between the two. It's not that lovely, wonderful weekend. It's not the vacation. It's what you do the other 50 or 51 uh, years, uh, uh, weeks out weeks. of the year. Yeah, not yeah. the big moments. It's the little moments that we live out over time. And I, I learned that really slowly, Catherine. I mean, I, I remember the first time I decided for us to stay home as a family of four uh, for an extended period of time uh, during a, a break from school. Mm -hmm. And the first Thanksgiving, we went to see my sister. Oh. I kind of protected myself emotionally by being in a much larger group of people, her family and so on. The next Thanksgiving... So just a year after the accident, um, we stayed home for five days. The weather wasn't any good and we played games. We, we were, in other words, we were trying to figure out what it meant to be a family of four mm. because my memory was a family of six and that's what I wanted it to remain. Mm. But we weren't a family of six anymore. We were a family of four. Right. And I, in fact, our photo gallery became the symbol of this, Catherine. So I, I had uh, some photos in our hallway of Linda and me, and uh, later on of Catherine, and then David, and then Diana, and, and then John. And then we had several photos of the six of us. And then we started having photos of the four of us. In other words, just in the case of family life, I had to figure out what life would look like as a family of four, because that's the story we had to live out. So instead of fixating on the loss, which I did, frankly, I mean, it was really painful and awful to look at what could come out of that loss in terms of, well, as you put it, the good heart story. Yeah. And boy, that takes time and prayer and patience and struggle and failure along the way. Uh, but I think for the most part, we did it. Now in our hallway, we have photos of a family of 23. Wow. By the way, I have five kids, my three of my own, two stepkids, all married. They're all friends, interestingly enough. And we now have 11 grandchildren. <laughs> that is interesting that they're all friends. And that's so amazing. So think that's... about the numbers. Six, four, 23. There's wow. the story. Yes, that's absolutely incredible. I love um, just how you are thinking and processing. And I love the thought of that new picture with the three on the same rock. That's just so beautiful. If I've learned anything after my stroke and all the disabilities, it's that life can be different, but it can still be good. A different kind of good, I guess you'd say. I know you've learned that too. I spend a lot of time thinking and teaching about how goodness has been redefined in my post-stroke life. I love the words of Sir Richard Baker that the good things of God are peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, fruition of presence in this life and the assurance of his face in the next. And you write that loss disabuses us of all the props we use to manage our well-being. It leaves us only with ourselves. So my question is, what did good mean to you before your life loss? And what were your props for well-being? Well, that's really easy to answer. I was happily married and I had four kids and I had just accepted a, a new job two years before in Spokane, Washington as an assistant professor of theology. And uh, my wife was a soprano soloist at our church, and uh, she was the director of the Spokane uh, area uh, children's choir, youth choir. Hmm. So we had a prosperous, busy, happy life. I had just started coaching my son, David, in soccer. Uh, I mean, there was, there was a lot there that was just rich and good and meaningful. Right. And it reminds me how much we define good by our circumstances. Um, Absolutely. I love the, the quote from Psalm 4, thou has given me more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. We usually define good by our grain and wine abounding. 
right? <laughs> yes. By yes. a prosperous uh, life and prosperous circumstances. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think that's very human to do. I don't, I don't sure. shame that. We yes. all want to be well married or we want to be content oh, yeah. as single people. We want to be successful in our vocations. Uh, we want to have a, a, a good circle of friends and right, of go course. on great vacations and lead a meaningful life. I mean, that is that, that that's that's normal and it's human. But we also live in a fallen world and we get these massive interruptions when life takes a sharp turn left or right and we don't like what it did to us. Mm -hmm. We lose a spouse, we lose a job, we go bankrupt, we have health problems, we lose, we lose someone important to us. Something happens that blows that up. And then we're forced to ask the question, what's the good life now? Right. What's the good life now? For sure, it yeah. Can't be, it can't be what it was. And part of the process of healing and redemption is to to redefine the good differently. Now, again, mm -hmm. Catherine, that's partly going to be circumstantial. I mean, we are human creatures. We're embodied creatures. We live in space and time. We have relationships and we have jobs and so on and so forth. So part of the good is to be able to adjust to a new set of circumstances and find the good there. And that means trusting in the Holy Spirit to redefine what we mean by joy and to find a new kind of peace, a new uh, kind of contentment. And that I think can happen over time as we trust in the redemptive story of God as it applies to our lives mm -hmm. and as we grow in the Holy Spirit. But what happens is we discover new capacities within ourselves to be loving and joyful and patient and kind and content even when circumstances uh, do not fit our desires and match our choosing. Mm. And that's, that's the secret over time. That's really powerful. You, you answered my next question, which was what does good mean to you now versus what yeah. it used to mean? But I think you well, covered that. <clears throat> well, yes and no. I mean, sure. Part of the good is that I finally remarried after 20 years but Catherine, it's so important for me to remember that those 20 years uh, led to a kind of hard fought contentment that did not require I remarry for happiness. Mm -hmm. I, I, I kid my, uh, my uh, wife, uh, Patricia, whom, by the way, I call my first wife the second time around. She's not a second wife. She's a first wife the second time around. I love that. And... Um, because she means so much to me as my first wife did. But um, I, I, I kid her every once in a while. I had to get to the point of realizing remarriage would not solve a problem. It would simply create a new kind of problem. Right. She yeah. always teases me or she always laughs. She kind of slaps me on the head and says, Jerry, that sounds so unromantic. But it really is true. Uh, you, in having children, you don't solve problems, you create different problems. Right. And you have to find a different kind of joy and contentment. For you sure. live uh, in the single life, you have one set of problems and need to find joy and contentment there. You remarry, you have a different set of problems and you need to find joy and contentment there. Mm -hmm. There is just no easy pathway, no right. circumstance, however curated, is going to lead instantly to the happy life. Ultimately, our happiness in life has got to come from a different source. Now, it'll work itself out in circumstances. It's not non-circumstantial, but the secret is not the circumstances themselves. It's the kind of work that God does in our hearts. Mm, yes, that's beautiful. Jerry, you've become an expert in what's helpful and what's not helpful in terms of grief. You advise to make yourself available, vulnerable, and present in the suffering of loved ones. I totally agree. So my question to you is what have you learned about responding to the suffering of your loved ones? And after you've experienced loss yourself, what are the, some practical ways you offer comfort to the people in your life who are suffering? 
Well, oh, that's such a great question, Catherine. And it's a mystery how all this unfolds. Uh, I look back on my experience and some of the people that I thought would be my key support after the accident did not become that. And others that I never even thought about did. Mm -hmm. So we have to hold all things loosely and prayerfully. Uh, in some cases, Catherine, I can have a cup of coffee with one person once, and that's all that is required. I might send a card. I might make a phone call. I might pay a visit. We might drop a meal off. And uh, for whatever reason, that's the extent of our contact, that moment of connection where we wish them well and we say that we're sorry and we press on. Yes. I rarely give any kind of answers. I never use my experience as a kind of trump card in conversation. Uh, I'm not an expert. I'm an right. expert only in my own story. I'm not an expert in yours, Catherine, or in right. anybody else's. Yeah. So I am very slow to give answers. I'm very slow to give advice. Yeah. Most of the time, I just want to be present and to smile and mm. to embrace and to say, I'm so terribly sorry this happened to you and let it go at that. I never quote the Bible. I don't do anything. Now in time, some people for whatever reason want to draw me into their orbit a little bit. And it means more than one cup of coffee or visit or whatever. And in some cases, uh, it lasts for a long, long time. And I never know ahead of time how that's going to unfold. So I hold it loosely. I'm, I'm not quick to give words. Uh, I'm not afraid to be present, but I don't come as a presence that gives answers. I come as a presence of somebody who will love them and pray for them and feel sorrow with them. I think you've been um, listening to me talk about some of these things because clearly you've been taking a playbook from Catherine. I like <laughs> to say less words yeah. are the best words. And yeah. I like to say that the ministry of presence is so much more important in the moment than the ministry of truth. You will get to truth one day. But goodness, don't explode platitudes on what I call putting Jesus stickers on bullet wounds. Oh, uh, that's, Jesus. I mean, you just gave me some, some of my own phrases I'm going to be using. I'll credit you, by the way, as a source. I love okay. and truth, uh, bandages on bullet wounds here. Mm -hmm. Oh, and less, less that is words. so oh. spot on. You oh, know, fact, thank you. Oh, I've had a number. I've had a number of people say I could write a book on all the stupid things people say, and I. I guess I. I could do that too. At this point, uh, I think we just have to realize people mean well, and they right. just don't know what to do, so they often say the wrong thing. Oh, I yeah. think we should err uh, with generosity of spirit instead of judgment. People I think mean well. They're trying yes. to do the best they can, and usually when there's a big loss, it's really awkward for everybody. That is so true. I, I attest, I get nervous. I say the one thing I don't want to say. I will ask someone in a terrible season of suffering, how are you? When I know full well, they're terrible. What I need to say is, how are you today? How are you right now? And instead I just like, hey, how are you? And they're like, my life's blown up. I'm absolutely <laughs> terrible. But I, yeah. I get nervous and I don't make space for that. So you are so right, dearie. Thank you. Okay, last question for you. Loss, as you and I know, can be a type of expansion rather than a diminishing. I love the newly emerging psych psychiatric discovery of post-traumatic growth which proves that suffering can make us measurably more resilient and hopeful. So my question is, what is the difference between the people who are expanded by loss and those who are diminished by it? Well, I honestly, Catherine, I don't know how to answer that question. I have, uh, because I'm in print, you know, a grace disguised, I, I hear a lot of stories mm. and I have a lot of conversations with people. I mean, I made my living as a church historian. So this is kind of a, a side, a side show for me, but it still happens. I, I hear from a lot of readers, yes. thousands of readers over the years. And I don't, 
I cannot explain why some people come out of a, a, a terrible loss. I mean, unspeakable loss in some cases. And over time become resilient, stronger, deeper, wiser, a beautiful, I mean, I look at you and you're beautiful, Catherine. Oh, I thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and I've seen that happen so many times and I've seen other people get stuck. And of course, being stuck some of the time is just normal and natural. We circle back, we go through a hard period, we get depressed. But, uh, but I'm talking about stuck over the long haul. They simply can't get out of the pit. Yes. And I, I don't know why that happens. I do know that mm. there are enough examples of people who are able to integrate the experience into a larger landscape, who are able to carry it in a way that makes them stronger and healthier and deeper and more available for other people. And I do know that's what I wanted for my life. Oh, goodness, me too. I, I wanted that for my life. And it took time. I mean, it was hard work. And it meant a lot of it meant a lot of losses along the way, and a lot of dark times. It wasn't uh, it wasn't instant. It wasn't after the first year, or second year, or uh, first month, or second month. I didn't I didn't turn my loss into a quick testimony right. of God's goodness. I mean, it was hard right. fought. Oh yeah. Uh, you you don't grow those shoulders broad uh, more broadly uh, in the weight room in a week. It takes a month. It takes years to do that. Right. And, but in uh, in the long term, I knew that I wanted that for my life, for my children who would pick up most of their cues for me and for the people around me. And I saw enough examples of that happening. Let me give you one. I got a, a letter from a woman. This is a number of years ago now. She told me her story. This was it. And she gave me permission to share it, by the way. <clears throat> she longed to have children. She had eight miscarriages in a row. Eight. And just oh. despaired of ever having children, oh, gave up, gosh. finally got pregnant, delivered the baby, lovely girl, uh, healthy, alive, beautiful. That daughter at 15 got cancer and died. Mm. Now, I can't, I have no rational comprehension of what that loss meant for her. Oh. That is so unspeakable and so painful. I... Honestly, I have no categories for something like that in my brain. Right. I accidentally met her at a restaurant maybe five years ago. <clears throat> and she stopped me because I didn't know what she looked like. She stopped me and said, Dr. Sitzer, I'm so-and-so. I wrote this letter to you or this couple of letters. And uh, uh, I was the one who told you this story. And she briefly re recalled it. And I looked under her face. Catherine, and I saw light mm. and I saw joy. Wow. I also saw pain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the light and the joy and the pain were all mixed together. Mm -hmm. And I walked away from that brief encounter and I thought, that's the kind of human being I want to be. Mm. When we think that the only way you can have joy is to eliminate sorrow and right. pain, mm -hmm. you'll never get to joy. Yes. I, I you completely. see joy and sorrow as not mutually exclusive, exclusive, right. but part of a larger whole. Right. Then I think you can land in joy. Once again, I think you're copying my words, but um, it's very well said. <laughs> joy and sorrow do coexist. They are not mutually exclusive, yeah. which brings me to... But I want to finally ask you, Jerry, which is what we ask on every episode <laughs> of the Good Heart Story podcast. We ask, what is good in your story? What is hard in your story? And how do you live in the tension of both of those in your Good Heart Story? Uh, what's hard, Catherine, is everything. I mean, strange as that is, I carry a wound. Mm. Uh, the wound is healed, yes. but it's still there. It's a scar. It's a mm. deep scar. Yes. Um, <coughs> it wasn't as if it were an amputation of, let's say, a limb. It was an amputation of myself over myself. There are and there were hard moments. There always will be. 
But it's so integrated into the fabric of my life, as strange as this sound, in one sense, everything is hard and everything is good. My first wife was never there for any of the birth of her grandchildren. She was there for none of their weddings, almost none of their recitals, all the vacations, none of it. She's always absent, mm -hmm. but she's always present in the absence. That's hard. I also have a gloriously lovely new wife. She's present. I have two stepdaughters and their husbands. I have their children in my life now. It's all good. And what happens is those two so bleed into each other, you can hardly make a distinction between the two. Mm. Initially, there were some things that were just plain really hard. Uh, I mean, hard in, in hard was its own category of difficulty. And then there were things that were good. Over time, those two bled together. And now it's all good and it's all hard. Mm. Wow, what a, what a beautiful answer. I'm just so um, overwhelmed. Everything, everything is good and everything is hard. That is so true. That's how life is. Wow, thank you for showcasing that reality so beautifully. I want to encourage listeners, if they have not read A Grace Disguised, um, they should read the 25th anniversary updated edition. Um, with an endorsement from the Whoops, who actually found deep encouragement in um, A Grace Disguised original edition <laughs> after my stroke. You know, Jerry, very strangely and sadly, um, there were so few and far between resources after my stroke for dealing with loss, not just of a stroke, but really anything, any deep loss. There was Christian that was um, kind of telling you how to move forward, <laughs> how to do life. Um, I call it be, how to be a survival guide. No, no one was telling, there were no survival guides. And I really wanted from a Christian perspective, the book, what now, what do I do now? How do I live? And the resources were lacking, really, really significantly lacking. So um, yours was one of the few that was counted as, okay, this guy can teach me some things about how to live. Johnny Erickson Tata was another. And there was a few, a few Christian voices, but not nearly enough. So I wanted to thank you. My pleasure. Aww. You're a good soul, Catherine. And if this is the only encounter we have, I'm the better for it. I want you to know that truly. Oh, my goodness. I am as well. And I am just so grateful that you said yes to this conversation. What a no, blessing this you. has been, no doubt, for all who are listening. So My pleasure, honestly. Thank you. God bless, God bless you. you, Jerry. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.